appreciate the singing tonight. And, uh, appreciate the good singing. And uh, thankful to be here once again and to be standing before everybody here once again. And many of you know my testimony. Uh, some of you, this is your first time meeting me, and I like sharing my testimony anyway, so I'm going to share it with you. Uh, this place is always very special to me. Uh, it was here when I was 13 years old. I was 13 years old, the very first time I ever came to, actually I think it was 12 at the time, uh, but the very first time I ever came to teen camp. And on the very first service, on the very first day, I got saved right back there. And we had service in here, and I went back and I prayed with somebody, and I got saved back on that very first service. I came here for uh, several years as a teenager growing up, and it was when I was 17, when I was 17 years old, I surrendered to preach. I prayed right here. That first year that I went, and after I got saved, I, I was baptized right out there in that lake. And uh, I thank God for what He's done here in my heart. This is my 13th year as a camper, and then a counselor, and now as a pastor. And uh, I thank God for working in my heart. And uh, I want you guys to do something for me. Several of you guys, you got your sunglasses on. And uh, we're, we're under the pavilion. You don't need that. So you guys go ahead and take your sunglasses off. All you guys that have that. I want to be able to see everybody and uh, see who I'm looking at and preaching to here tonight. Uh, but God's done a, a lot of work in my heart over the years here at this place. As a camper, as a counselor, and as a pastor, God's worked in my heart. And it's my prayer every single year that God would do something in your heart just like He's done in mine. Right. It's my prayer that this place would become as special to you right. as it's become to me. I just want to see you raise your hands. How many of you over these years... How many of you have gotten saved here at camp? Did you slip your hand up? You've gotten saved here. Several hands here uh, on this side. and uh, Thank God for that. I, I know there's been some that have surrendered to preach here uh, while we've come through these years. But I believe that God wants to do a work tonight. Amen. You know, I, I thank God for what He did in my heart all those years ago. I, I thank God for saving me. I thank God for uh, calling me to preach. But God wants to do something tonight. You know, I, I can't live off of what God did in my heart years ago. I, I can't live even off of what God did last night. And I thank God for the message that we heard last night and how God worked in hearts. But I can't live off of that. I need something tonight. And I believe God has something for us here this evening. And I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. In this passage of Scripture, Jesus has been teaching. And many of you know that Jesus often taught in parables. And a parable is a, a story. It's a story that Jesus made up. And Jesus used a made-up story to teach a heavenly truth. He wanted to teach something spiritual to people that were listening. And He taught in such a way that everyone was able to understand. Jesus was the very best teacher this world has ever seen. But Jesus here at the end of Mark chapter 4, he's finished his parables. And I want us to pick up here in verse number 35. Mark chapter 4, verse number 35. The Bible says, And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was, in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and they say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose, and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and sea obey him? Uh, I want to talk to you tonight about this thought. Peace in the storm. Peace in the storm. 
Many of these men, they, they were fishermen. They knew what it was to be out on sea. They, they knew what it was to go through some storms. No doubt that many of them, as they had gone out fishing, that they had encountered storms before. But the Bible says that they were so afraid in this storm. They were so afraid that they thought that they were going to die. You know, this is not me going out into a boat and a little bit of a wave comes and I'm thinking, okay, this is it. This is the end for me. No, these men, they were professionals. This was their life. They knew what it was to be in a storm, but here they are, and they think they're about to die. That's right. But in spite of all their fear, in spite of the storm, where do we find Jesus? Yep. The Bible says that he's on the hinder part of the ship. He's in the back part of the ship, and he's taking a nap. And Brother Travis was wearing a shirt today that said, Jesus took naps. Amen. And thank God that Jesus took naps. <laughs> okay, just don't take a nap here tonight, and that will be all right. But Jesus, in the middle of the storm, here are his disciples, and they're thinking they're going to die. It's that bad. The, the, the waves are tossing them about. The rain is coming down. There's thunder. There's lightning. Jesus is asleep. He's back there taking a nap. And they say, Jesus, don't you care? Don't you care about us? And Jesus got up. He rebukes the wind. He rebukes the sea. Everything is calm and still. I want to tell you that we all go through storms of life. We all have storms. You say, well, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Now, that means that we all go through troubles. Yeah. Some of you right now are going through troubles. That if, if we were to go around the room and share what it is that we're going through right now, every one of us would be shocked. Yeah. We would say, I have no idea. Exactly I'm so right. sorry. I didn't know that you were going through that at home. I, I, I didn't know that this is what you're dealing with. Right now, I had no idea that this is the storm that you're faced with. But as Christians, and I hope that every single one of you know Christ as your Savior. Amen. But if you don't, tonight's the night. Yeah. Tonight's yeah. the night to trust Him. But as Christians, we all go through storms. We all have trials. We all have struggles. There are challenges that come into every single one of our lives. We don't have to fear the storm. But I believe that sometimes, just like the disciples, we lack faith. We lack faith. We wonder, Jesus, don't you see what I'm going through? Jesus, don't you care about me? Jesus, don't you see my storm? I'm following you. I'm living for you. I'm, 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 I'm one of your disciples. Don't you care about me? We're just like them. Yeah. But I want to tell you that Jesus has something for us in the storm. Yeah. He has something for us in the storm. The Bible tells us in verse number 38, and he says, and when he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. Jesus, he was asleep on a pillow. He had perfect peace. I want to tell you that we can take peace in Christ. Amen. Number one, I want you to see this. Number one, we can take peace in his promises. We can take peace in his promises. Look with me in verse number 35. The Bible says, In the same day when the evening was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. There's a promise there. Did you catch it? That's right. There's a promise. You say, Well, hold on. I don't see any promise here in this verse. I don't see Jesus promising his disciples anything. This is what he said to them. He said, Let us pass over to the other side. Yeah. You know what he's saying? He's saying, We're going to the other side. That's right. When they get onto the boat and that storm has come and they're afraid that they're going to die, all they had to go back to was, Jesus said, we're going to the other side. That is a promise. That is a promise that Jesus gave these men. He said, hey, get in the boat. We're going to the other side. We can take peace in his promises. You know why Jesus gave that promise that he was going to the other side? There was still work to be done. Jesus wasn't going to die in that boat. Jesus still had work to do. We, we find, if you go into Mark chapter 5, that as they get over to the other side, uh, there is a man that we often refer to as the maniac of Gadara. When Jesus came into contact with this maniac, that maniac did not stay a maniac. That maniac got saved. Those demons fled that man's body. That man was born again. And the Bible says, I, I believe that this man, he went out and he preached Jesus. He, he, he wanted to follow after Jesus. He wanted to continue with him. And Jesus did something very, very special here for this maniac of Gadara. 
He said, I want you to stay right here. I know that you're saying that you want to come with me, but I want you to stay right here. Yes. That man had a job. Jesus, after he finished with that maniac at Gadara, they got back in the boat and they came right back where they had just left from. And when he got back in that boat and they went to the other side again, uh, the Bible says that he runs into a man named Jairus. Jairus, he's got a 12-year-old daughter. This daughter is right at the point of death. She's getting ready to die and Jairus comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, you've got to come with me. You've got to help me. My daughter's going to die. And as Jesus goes with Jairus, there's a woman that stops him. There's a woman with the issue of blood, the Bible says. She's had this for 12 years. And she reaches out and she touches the hem of his garment. And there Jesus stops and he deals with this woman. And he says, your faith has made you whole. All the while, Jairus is waiting. And Jairus is waiting and he says, my daughter's going to die. And Jairus, he ended up getting a great miracle on that day. Right. Yeah. Jesus went and that daughter lived. She had died, but Jesus raised that little girl from the dead. You know what I'm telling you tonight? Jesus said, we're going to the other side because I've still got work to do. I'm not done yet. It's not over. Jesus ultimately had to go to the cross. So what I'm saying tonight is that we can take peace in His promises. We have the promises of God in His Word. So what does He promise us? He promises us that He's never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. If you're here and you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, He will never leave you. He's never going to forget about you. He's never going to forsake you. He's never going to turn His back on you. We have this promise of God. And what we need to do is we need to cling to the promises of God. We need to hold on to that promise and say, Lord, I know that you promised you're never going to leave me. And I know it looks dark. I know it looks hard. I know that things are challenging right now. But Lord, I'm going to cling to this promise. You're never going to leave me. He gave us the promise. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. That's a promise of God. He, he promised that He would hear us when we pray. I wonder how many of us have a real prayer life. Some of you, you might pray before a meal. And if you do, that's good. I'm thankful for that. If you don't, you should begin to pray before you eat. Right. Thank God for your food. Right. But if that's all you're praying throughout the day, that's not a real prayer life. God has promised. He said, when you pray, I hear and answer prayer. Right. How many of you, and I don't want you to raise your hand, I just want you to think about this. How many of you have ever seen an answer to prayer in your life? Yes. You don't have to raise your hand. I don't want you to raise your hand. But have you seen an answer to prayer in your life? And if you're sitting there thinking, I, I can't really remember one. I can't think of one. So one of two things that's happening. Either you're not saved, because the Bible says that He's not going to hear those that He doesn't know. And if you're here and you don't know Christ as your Savior, you're, you're, you're not His child. Right. So either you're not saved, or the second option is you're saved, but you're not praying nearly enough. You're not praying nearly enough. If you're not going and taking your request to God, if you're not going to Him and praying to Him, he promised that He will hear and answer our prayers. We have another promise. We have the promise of the rapture. I thank God that one day we are going to be raptured out of here. Some of you, you might be here and you say, well, what does that mean? That means that Jesus has promised that He's coming back for the church. He's coming back for His bride. And that in a split second, the Bible says in the twinkling of an eye, that means faster than you can blink your eye, we'll go from here to there. We will be gone. We will be raptured away. That's a promise of God. You know what another great promise is? I believe one of the greatest promises, if not the greatest promise, that God gives us in His Word. He says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord yeah. shall be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, He promised that when you call upon Him, you ask Him to save you, you believe that He is who He says He is. That He died for you after living a sinless life, was buried, rose again the third day, and you call upon Him and you ask Him to save you. The Bible says He will. He will. Some of you, you're here and without a doubt, you're here and you're lost. You don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Take peace in His promises. Take peace in that one specific promise 
that He will save you when you call upon Him. I also want us to see that we can take peace in His people. We can take peace in His people. Look with me in verse number 36. The Bible says, And when they had sent away the multitude, they took Him even as He was in the ship. And there was also with Him other little ships. As we think about this story, and I'm sure, no doubt, if you've been in church any amount of time at all, you've heard preaching on this passage. And you've heard preaching about how Jesus calmed the storm. But what we often forget about is that these disciples weren't the only ship in the storm. Yeah. The Bible says that there were other little ships out there on the sea. So when that storm hit, when those waves came in and that thunder roared and the lightning flashed, and these men thought that they were going to lose their life, there are other little ships out there in the sea thinking the same thing. They're thinking, we're going to lose it. We're, we're done for. We're going under. This is our last day here on earth. I want to tell you that when you go through the storms of life, realize that you're not alone. There's other little ships out there with you. There's other people that have gone through or are going through exactly what you're going through. Sometimes we like to think to ourselves, nobody knows how I feel. Nobody knows what I'm going through. I thank God for the church. Amen. And yeah. some of you, if you're here and you're not faithful in church, be faithful in church. Right. You know what the church is? It's a bunch of other little ships. Yeah. Yeah. People that are going through the same thing that you've gone through. Dealing with some of the same stuff that you're dealing with. And you don't have to do it alone. Right. Uh, the Christian life is not meant to be lived alone. Exactly. Right. Some of you, you know the, the children's song, I'm in the Lord's Army. Yes, sir. I, I'm not going to sing it for you. I don't sing like they sang here tonight. We are in the Lord's army. We're not a lone soldier out there. Right, right. We're in this together. Yes. We, we're meant to live the Christian life together. There's other little ships out there that are going through the same thing. And they can help us. And they can encourage us. And they can pray with us. And they can do all that they can. The Bible says in the book of Galatians that we're to bear one another's burdens. Right. Right. Yeah. Some of you, you're bearing some things tonight that you have, you have no idea how you're going to make it. You have no idea how you're going to keep going on. You just don't know how you can make it another day. You don't need to bear it alone. Right. Yeah. We can bear one another's burdens. Say, well, how do I do that? Come and say, hey, can you pray with me? Right. Let me tell you what I'm dealing with. Can you pray with me? Can you help me? Go to some of these counselors and say, I, I just really need some help. I need some advice. I need some encouragement. There's other little ships. You are not alone. I want you to look in your Bibles with me uh, to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings, look with me in chapter 19. Elijah is one of my favorite people in the Bible. Some of the, the, the greatest miracles that we find in the Bible, God used Elijah to perform them. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah was there on Mount Carmel. Many of you know the story. He challenged the prophets of Baal. And as he challenged the prophets of Baal, here he was before hundreds of them, and he mocked them, and he made fun of their God. Right. They had this contest, and they said, we're going to see who has the real God here tonight. And as he stood before these hundreds of prophets, the, the challenge was this. Whoever can pray and have fire come down from heaven, let their God be the one true God. So these prophets of Baal, he said, all right, you guys, you go ahead. You take your turn. So they went, and they spent all day. They were crying out to Baal, who did not hear them because Baal does not exist. I want to tell you, there's only one God, and that is the God of the Bible. But these prophets, they, they cried out, and Elijah stood over there and he said, Hey, cry out a little bit louder. Maybe he can't hear you. Hey, maybe he's going on a hunting trip. Maybe, maybe he'll be back in a little bit. Maybe your God's on vacation. Maybe he's sleeping. And they just made, he made fun of them. I can't imagine doing that to hundreds of prophets. But Elijah was bold. Yeah. And then they got done. They had been crying and they had been cutting themselves and screaming out all day long. And then Elijah said, all right, it's my turn. He prayed a quick prayer. But before he did that, he said, hey, I want you to take all this water. I want you to dump it over all of this wood that we have on this altar. If you've ever tried to start a fire, you know that wet wood does not work too well. So he said, let's get it soaking wet. So they took it, 
until everything was as wet as it could possibly be. Elijah prayed just a quick prayer and immediately fire came down from heaven. It burnt up that wood. Not only did it burn up that wood, it burnt up all the water that had begun to fall around it. It burnt up those rocks. Yeah. Elijah's proved that day the God of the Bible. He's the one true God. Amen. Elijah's coming off this literal mountaintop experience. Yeah. And then we get to chapter 19. That's right. And as we get to chapter 19, the Bible says that there's this wicked woman named Jezebel. And Jezebel wants to kill Elijah. Elijah hears this. He's just challenged all of these prophets. He's had this boldness. He's had this courage. You would think, okay, he's just seen God send fire down from heaven. I would think that he would say, all right, Jezebel, bring it on. You've just seen what my God can do. I'm not afraid of you. But that's not what he did. Elijah was afraid. He ran for his life. And as he ran for his life, the Bible tells us, look at me in verse number 9 of 1 Kings 19. The Bible says, And he came thither unto a cave, and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left. And they seek to take my life, to take it away. He tells God, he says, you know, I've been, I've been so bold for you, Lord. You've seen what I've done. God, you know who I am. And he says, God, I'm the only one left. I'm the last one standing. I want you to see what God tells Elijah. Go down with me to verse number 18. He says, yet, in verse number 18, yet have I left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. You know what God tells Elijah? Elijah, you think you're the only one. I've got 7,000 more just like you. You're not alone. Sometimes we can go through this life and we feel like we're all alone, that we're doing this all by ourselves, that nobody cares about us. I remember growing up in church, and uh, I shared this at our home church. There was a man that would get up, and every single Sunday night, uh, this is what he would say. He would give a report about different things that was happening, and this is how he would begin every single Sunday. He would say, there's no place like this place anywhere around this place, so this must be the place. And I know what he was trying to say now, but at the time, I was thinking, well, there's no place like this place. No place anywhere around this place like this. This must be the place. This must mean I'm, I'm all alone. When we came to camp, we didn't do it like this. We were, we were by ourselves. It was just our team group. You guys, you can look around and you can see these other churches and you can say, no, I'm not alone. Amen. We're not the only church. There's other teams that are going through the same thing I'm going through. They're, they're, I, I am not the only one that's taking a stand for the Lord. As I went to school, and many of you, just like me, uh, you go to public school. I went to public school. And, and there was so many different bad things that I saw and witnessed. And so often I thought, I'm all that God has here. I thought I was all by myself. It's a lonely feeling. It's a scary feeling. Yeah. But I want to encourage you and let you know you're not alone. That's right. You can take peace in His people. I'm so glad I look around and I see many of you have made friends. you made friends within your church group and outside of your church group. Many of you, you keep in contact throughout the year with one another. Thank God for that. Amen. Thank God that you're not alone. That you have other people that you're going through this life with. We can take peace in His people. Thirdly, I want you to see that we can take peace in His presence. Amen. We can take peace in His presence. I want you to go back with me to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 4. I'll ask a very simple question, and you all know the answer. Who is Jesus? I think you all know the answer. Who is Jesus? God. He's the Son of God. He is the Son of God. Did Jesus know that the storm was approaching? Yes. Did Jesus know everything that they were getting ready to go through? Yes. But I want you to see this. We can take peace in His presence. Jesus knew the storm was coming, 
And where was he? He was on board. Amen. Jesus got on that boat. He got on that ship with the disciples. Realize that when you go through the storms of life, Jesus is right there with you. Amen. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. He's not going to say, all right, time for the storm. I'm out of here. Let's see how you handle it. No, he's with you every step of the way. Jesus was on board of that ship. He was with them through the storm. And he's with you in your storms. I want you to turn with me to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 here this evening. If you know your Bible, you know that Genesis chapter 6 is dealing with Noah. You talk about a storm. This was a storm. Right. Genesis chapter 6, this is God speaking to Noah here. Verse number 18. Genesis chapter 6, verse number 18. The Bible says, But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy wives, or the, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. I want you to go back and look with me at something here. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt, look at these next two words, come into the ark. God is speaking to Moses or to Noah here. And he's making this covenant with Noah. And as he's telling Noah to get into the ark, what does he say? He does not say, when you go into the ark. He says, when you come into the ark. He said, okay, so what? What's the difference? If I got a phone call right now, I wouldn't answer it. But if I got a phone call a little bit later tonight, and somebody needed to go to the church building back home, they had something that they needed to drop off, they had something they needed to deliver, you know what I would tell them? I would say, go in. Go in. But last night, me and Brother Lee, we were talking and we got a knock on the door. And you know what we said? We said, come in. You know why? Because we were already inside. You know what God said to Noah while Noah was preparing to get into the ark? He said, come into the ark. Why? Because God was already there. God was in the ark with Noah and he's with you in your storms. God's not going to leave you by yourself to go through the storms. He says, come in. I'm already there. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm not going to turn my back on you. He says, come in. I'm going to be with you in the storm, Noah. And you know what he said to these disciples? He said, you get on that ship and I'm going to be there with you. I'm not going to stand on the other side and just leave you to fight for yourself. No, you get on the ship. I'm going to be there with you. Now, as we look at Mark chapter 4 again, the Bible speaks very specifically about where Jesus is. Yeah. Right. Again, we, we see here in uh, verse number 38, and the Bible says, And he was in the higher part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. Now, as I, I studied out these boats, these old time, uh, this era type of boat, you know, they didn't have the sails like sometimes you see. Obviously, they didn't have an engine like you see in many boats today. It, 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 wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't controlled by a wheel up at the front. Do you know how they controlled the boat? There was a rudder that was in the back, in the hinder part of the ship. When Jesus was back there and he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep, do you realize that he was still in control? He had his hand. He was right there on the rudder. He was steering the ship. He was still in control. And when you go through the storms of life, when you have the problems that come in and you have challenges and you have issues and you have difficulties, Jesus is still in control. He hasn't taken his hand off the steering wheel. Jesus is in control in the storm. He's not forgotten about you. He's still with you. He is in control in the storm. We can take peace in His presence. That's good. I want you to see that we can take peace in His power. We can take peace in His power. Look with me in verse number 37. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. We see here in verse number 37, there arose a great storm. Look with me in verse number 39. And He arose. We see in verse number 37 that there arose a great storm, but in verse number 39 we see that Jesus arose. Anytime that a storm arises in your life, so does Jesus. 
He's not going to forget about you. Jesus is greater than the storm. He's greater than your problem. He's greater than your sin. Don't think to yourself that whatever it is that you're going through, that God's forgotten about you and that it's too big for Him. No, He's greater than the storm. When that storm arises, so does Jesus. He is the God of all creation. He is all powerful. He had the power over the storm. Now we see that Jesus, all he had to do was speak. All he had to do was say the words and everything stopped. We see that we take peace in his power, but lastly, I want us to see that we can take peace in his peace. Jesus was asleep. Why? Because he was at complete peace. I don't know about you guys, but I know when I'm trying to go to sleep, if I'm stressed out about something, if I'm worried about something, I have a hard time falling asleep. Yeah. Anybody else like that? That's right. But when I'm relaxed, when I am at perfect peace, I can sleep like a baby. It's easy. Why do you think that Jesus was able to sleep in the storm? Because he had perfect peace. He knew what he was getting ready to do. This was not going to take him by surprise. We, we see here, again, I want us to go in verse number 39. The Bible says, And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. I'm sure we've all heard about the calm before the storm. Yeah. This is the calm immediately after the storm. You know, oftentimes, as we have a big storm, we'll see a big storm that will come through, and you know, we, we just saw a lot of rain uh, here just a little while ago. And usually what will happen is we will have the heavy part of the storm, and it's really bad. But as it continues to move out, it just kind of tapers off. We'll see a lot of rain, we'll see a lot of wind, and then it's just a little bit of rain. The wind begins to slow down. Eventually, it's just sprinkling in a little bit. And ultimately it stops. But the Bible tells us here that in the worst part of the storm, in the middle of the storm, Jesus speaks the words and just like that, it's over. Can you imagine seeing the worst storm that you've ever seen in your life? And in one split second, the skies are clear. The water is calm. I don't even believe that there was a breeze in the air at that moment. I believe everything was just perfectly still. Perfectly calm. That's exactly what Jesus does. Right. It was immediate. Right. Do you know when I asked the Lord to save me all those years ago? Because I prayed right back there. Do you know that that salvation was immediate? That's right. When I called upon the Lord and asked Him to save me, it took place immediately. Amen. I didn't have to wait until I got baptized. I didn't have to wait until I was good enough and say, okay, Lord, I pray that you would save me and eventually one day you're going to do it. No, it was immediate. It took place right away. And when Jesus speaks the words, it happens instantly. Yeah. That's what took place in the storm. He said, peace be still. The waves were done. The clouds were gone. Everything had ceased because that's exactly how God works. Why did Jesus allow the storm in the first place? Sometimes we ask ourselves that. We, we go through challenges. I've, I, I've been through challenges. I've had issues in my life. And, and sometimes as we go through it, we say, Lord, why? Why? Why are you allowing this? Again, these are, these are his disciples. They're following him. They're living for him. They're going to hear him preach. They're going to hear him teach. They're seeing the miracles. They're praying with him. They're doing all the right things. Lord, why, why send the storm in their life? And sometimes I'll have to admit that I ask the same thing. I say, Lord, I'm trying my best. I'm wanting to serve you. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the right things. I'm not, I'm, I'm not perfect. But Lord, I'm trying why am I getting the storm? Why, did, why not somebody down the street? Lord, uh, there's all these sinners around me. Why not them? I want you to see what happens here in verse number 41. The Bible says, And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and sea obey him? Yeah. That storm came into their life to teach them. Yeah. They had been following Jesus. They had been with Jesus. 
But they learned a little bit more about him on that day. When you go through the storms of life, Jesus is trying to teach you something about himself. I, I want to tell you, don't waste a storm. Don't waste a storm and just feel so discouraged and so down that you never even go to God. That you never cling to Him. That you don't grow closer through the storm. Don't waste the storm because He's trying to teach you something. That's right. He wants to teach you something about Himself through the storm. Don't waste your storms. And some of you, again, you're going through stuff right now. You have challenges. You have, you have things that we couldn't even begin to imagine. Don't waste it. Go to God. Say, Lord, I, I need you desperately in this hour. I need you at this time. I can't do this by myself. Lord, I can't make it through the storm. I need you. That's where he wants us. And I can tell you that just like that, the storm can be gone. But he wants to teach you something. Right. He wants to teach you something. Again, some of you, you're here tonight and you don't know Christ as your Savior. And just like that, the storm can be gone, and just like that, you can be born again. Yep. Yep. You can call him on the Lord tonight. He will forgive you of your sins, yep. and you can know for sure that heaven is your home. The Bible tells us in 1 John that these things have been written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. Amen. Some of you are here, and you're not sure. You have some doubts. You have some questions. The Bible makes it clear that we can know that we have eternal life. I'm going to ask you, do you have peace tonight? Do you have peace? Are you just constantly troubled? Are you constantly fretting? Are you constantly worried? Are you constantly stressed out? As you're going through the storms of life, are you turning to Him? Do you have peace tonight? Jesus promises us that peace that passes all understanding. That's what I want. I want that peace that passes all understanding. That's what I want. Lord, we thank you tonight.